All right, folks, back on the Boss Man Show with Coach Charles Huff, Marshall Thunder and Herd, the Conference USA. Coach, how things going up there for you guys, man? Man, we're doing well, man. Obviously, we are um, in the middle of the season here, grinding through, um, you know, working to, to kind of close the gap and try and get better. Um, we've got some good things going on. We've got some things we got to get cleaned up. Um, but, you know, it's exciting. You know, the uh, community's all behind us. Uh, players are working hard. Um, so I couldn't be happier. And, Coach, I know you don't do more, more victories, but you got to be happy where you got to compete. I know you lost three, three games in a row, but you've competed well in every game. Could have won every game, a player two here or there. So talk about how your guys are very close to being 5-0, even though they, they didn't win the games, but they very play well and can learn from the, the tape here and see, hey, if we do this better, execute a little better, we can get these wins going down the stretch here. Yeah, and I think the word you use is exactly, you know, what we are, we're close. Um, and, and, you know, when you're close to anything, you know, it's the little things that make the difference. And I think sometimes um, as players, coaches, and, and, you know, and, and people in general, um, you, you devalue the little things until it catches up to you when it catches up to you. Um, and we've just been in a situation where um, it's been multiple little things. You know, when I talk to the thing, we just got to kind of put it all together. Um, great learning opportunities, great learning experiences, um, a lot of positives that come out of those things. You know, I don't, uh, I don't believe in failure. You know, I believe in learning. Um, you know, you start failing when you stop learning. Um, and I think our team is learning and I think we're putting ourselves in position um, to clean up those things and, and, and be able to build on them moving forward. It's, you know, it's your, being your year one for you there, you know, building your culture. Guys can see how you handle adversity as a coach and your staff, and it can help them get in their, in their brains. Okay, we see how coach handle these things. He wants to learn. We're not feeling here. It's about getting better every day. So I feel like your guys are in a great spot because your your mindset. And I've watched you guys on film. you got to compete hard. So it's not like you're not playing all these like little things here and there. But I feel like doing this in year one, it'll set the standard for going forth from two, three, four. And on, and on, so all, all the rest of the time, you're there up in Marshall, yeah. coach. I think, I think the biggest thing is, like you said, you, you, when you're building a culture, it's a process. It's not a switch. You know, anytime you – if I was – I don't know who, who won the Super Bowl last year, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. If I took over the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and just came in and did the exact same thing that, that you know, the old coach did, even then it still takes time. You know, I think anytime you have different relationships, different nucleuses, um, this team is 100% different than last year's team. I think a lot of people sometimes think – Oh, they returned a lot of starters. Well, these guys are a year older. There's been people that have moved on. Their people's lives change. Um, so any team you have, whether you've been in a place, you know, Coach Saban used to say it all the time. You know, we've been here in Alabama for a long time, but every team is different. So every team takes time to kind of work through the things that they need to be able to work through, to grow together, to work together. And it's magnified when you have a brand new coaching staff. You know, it's new relationships, um, new expectations. Um, but I think the guys have done a phenomenal job of, of buying into what we're asking them to do. Um, and buy-in does not mean fully understanding. Buy-in means I'm going to try to do what you say do, even though I may not understand it. Culture comes when they understand why you're asking them to do what you're doing. Um, so I think we're getting to that point. And how has it been, Coach, you know, meeting all your, your players new and then know, learn, learn, learn your new team? I feel like the, both, both, I have fun when I get new interns, Coach. That's my fun part. You live to learn about new interns, learn how they operate, learn about them personally. So how's it feel, you know, to learn these guys who you took over and they, they know that you're that you're their guy? Like, you chose them. It's like, it's, I know some guys are like, well, you, I, you don't recruit me, but you, I chose you guys. How's that been for you and your staff, man? I, I think it's been great. You know, I think, you know, we, we, are, we are intentional about being relational. You know, I think that's the key. I think building a relationship before you before you can motivate or before you can, you know, direct anyone, you got to build a relationship. Um, and, and I think sometimes, you know, people forget that that takes time. You know, we're talking about young men and women in our program because you're building with the entire organization, not just the players, but the assistants and the you know staff. And, and, and it takes time to build a relationship because the relationship is built over trust. Trust is built over time tested events. You know, so how can I trust you if, if you've never been put in a situation for me not to trust you? So some of those things take time. And I think as we continue to grow, I think our players know that we have their back. I think our players know that, yeah, we coached them hard. Yeah, we worked them hard, but we're ultimately doing it for their success um, or their benefit. Um, so it's, it's been good, you know, and obviously, you know, over time, each each season changes. When I say season in the spring, you know, you're learning your players, but there's no pressure of a game. You know, in the, in the winter, you're learning your players, but there's no pressure of a game. But then you get in the season, you know, it's a different learning. You know, people react different when they actually are on the air with you 
then when they're talking behind the scenes and, you know, so there are different, there's different phases that you got to kind of work through and get to know each other. Most definitely coach. And I feel like this coach with your mindset, how you set in that center for your young men, did it, the mental health piece is so important for young men. Like coach. I feel like, you know, having a young guy like yourself can relate to him still. You're not, you're not like me. You're about the same age. We, we can't relate to these guys still, you know, cause we got too much of an OG. We, still can't, we got some age over us right though. So I feel like, so how have you approached their mental health and development and growing them as young men off the field as well, coach? Yeah. Well, w w one of the, you know, things that I was able to do thanks to the administration here, um, as we were able to hire a mental health uh, specialist to actually work with our players. They'd never had it before. So just imagine if you know, take, a, take a cancer patient and this person has, has, has had cancer for the last four or five years and they've never been able to get treatment. But then you come in and you present chemo. Well, you still, it takes time for that chemo to work. You know? So when we got here, that was something that I'm big on, I believe in. Um, and our players have that resource now and they're learning how to use that. It's helping them become better. Um, you know, these are the things that people don't see when you lose three games in a row, which I fully understand what my job is. But our players are getting better. And I'm not talking about X's and O's. I'm talking about like you talked about mental health. You know, we've had guys with issues. We've had guys come in the office and say, coach, I never felt like I could talk to anybody about this coach. I never even knew this was something that I could get help with. To me, those are the small victories that ultimately will show up on the field. You know, and that's why I say it takes time. It's not a switch where all of a sudden I come in and I tap everybody on the head and we go win, you know, 18 national championships. It's not how it works. Uh, but as those players start to unwind or unravel some of the craziness that's going on in their head and have support, as they start to build trust, well, then their on-field performance will start to be more consistent. It's hard to go out and perform on Saturday with people yelling at you when you're thinking about, you know, mom being homesick or your girlfriend called you last night and she was arguing with you, or you felt depressed this morning, or you feel like if you don't make this play, the world's going to end. You know, you don't believe in yourself because you dropped this ball in practice. A lot of that stuff matters. You know, and a, lot of, a lot of people don't really think of that. But as a head coach, you got to manage all of that. And Coach Huff, that's why I try to go, do, use my sort of show the listeners here that, hey, it's more than X's and O's out here. It takes more than oh, just yeah. the X's and O's. You, you got to be father figure, the brother, the counselor. You know, you can wear a lot of hats as the head coach and as yeah. a assistant coach as well. So everything you do, the X's and O's is just the fun part of it. But it's the other part off the field of those other 21 hours of, of, a day that you're not on practice field is where it really matters what your job yeah. is, what you get paid for. Yeah, and, and, I, and I understand that. And I'm, like I said, I don't use those things as an excuse because ultimately – um, you know, a doctor is hired to fix people and they don't care how you talk to them. You know, hey, you make them feel if you don't fix them, you're not doing your job. Um, I'm hired to ultimately win football games. I fully understand that. Um, but there is more to baking a cake than just putting the, the, the pan in the oven. Um, so I think over time, you know, people will start to see that when you build a program for sustained success, I'm not trying to just be a flash in a pan and get to the next job. It's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build this program for a sustained success so that year after year after year after year after year, our program will be stable. We'll, you know, we'll be able to win. We'll be able to put guys, you know, moving on with their careers, whether it's on the field, off the field, whatever it is, and our program will have stability. Most definitely, Coach. Talk about this uh, recruiting-wise. Uh, you know, Conference USA, a name brand conference, a, a lot of great schools across the, from the Mid-Atlantic all the way to the Southwest out there, all the different members you have. Talk about recruiting young men, with the footprint you all have, how the portal can help you as well, filling gaps where, where you can't get it, where you're trying to give a high school guy as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously you want to take jobs where you have an opportunity to recruit um, talent in the radius. You know, you talk about a five-hour radius around your university where most of the time, most of those young men can keep their support system intact. You know, they want their moms or dads or grandmother, their family to be able to come see them play. They want to be able to get home when they need to. You know, so if you got a good fertile ground around five hours, you, you got a chance to be really successful and build a culture of a, of a program. Because then again, in that area, because the kids have come from that area, that five-hour radius, the school and the brand has, has, has a name, it has value. You know, people that live around the school, they take pride in it. Hey, you know, my little cousin went to, you know, went to Marshall. He, he three hours away. Let's go see him play. You know what I mean? So it has value. Um, I think the farther you get outside of that five-hour radius, it gets a little watered down because you're probably competing with some other university or some other brand. 
you know, so you got you just got to be mindful of that. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go to Florida or California or Texas and get players. It just means you want to try to get the bulk of your roster from right near home. Um, and then obviously the transfer portal creates opportunities um, to plug gaps, you know, where you may have a guy leave early. You may have a guy leave, you know, transfer somewhere else. And instead of having to play a player that may not be ready physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever it may be, you can have an opportunity to not let your team slip by filling it in with the transfer portal guys. You know, a guy, an older guy or a guy that was somewhere, went too far away from home, wanted to get close on whatever it is. I think you got to be mindful when you're talking about transfer portal. This is not free agency. You know, you're bringing foster kids into your home. So I think you have to be mindful. Yeah. So-and-so may be playing at XYZ University and may be really good, but does he fit our program? Does he fit our need? So you got to kind of evaluate and recruit the portal as well as you do the high school guys. You go to high school and you find out what kind of kid he is, what kind of grades he has. You know, is he in the community doing the right things on and off the field? How does he work? I think you got to do the same things in the portal because, again, you don't want to bring kids, especially older kids, into your program who you don't have an opportunity to mold, you don't have an opportunity to change, um, and then they become issues. No doubt. And, Coach, tell us about this. you got an old Dominion coming up this week. Uh, what's been the keys for you this week against those guys, man? Another, another conference game for you guys there. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is, is, is we got to take care of us. You know, I, I feel like I told the team, you know, we have lost the last three games. We didn't get beat. Um, you know, most games are, or more games are lost than won. You know, teams don't go out and win games. You know, usually another team loses a game. How? Turnovers, penalties, you know, poor execution. And that's kind of that's when our, our, our tell the story. Last game we had six turnovers. You, you can't win on Madden with six turnovers. Um, it, it's hard to do. Um, so I was going out this week against another conference opponent, really good opponent. Uh, we we got to take care of us. You know, we got to go out and actually make them beat us, not give them the game, you know, and that starts with obviously protecting the ball, doing a really good job of consistently executing and then minimizing their big plays on the other side. No doubt. And coach, you went to Hampton. Tell me about going to HBCU, HBCU school. I know the Pirates up there down in the Big South. I know that's your alma mater. Tell us about your experience at Hampton and then HBCU school and, and why, why did you choose to go to HBCU school as well? Yeah, no, you know, Hampton was great to me. Uh, it was four hours away from home. Actually, my brother had went there. My older brother had went there. So I had a lot of familiarity with it. Um, I was able to play football. I thought, you know, coming from the area that I came from, I thought the cultural change would be good for me. Um, you know, being able to, to have both sides of it being, you know, mixed with different, you know, races, different ethnicity, different, um, you know, social backgrounds. Um, so it was good for me. And it was a small school, you know, it was a small school. So I was able to kind of, um, you know, not feel overwhelmed. You know, sometimes your kids go to school, these major schools and they feel overwhelmed. Um, so it was good for me. Played four years there, learned a lot. Um, still get an opportunity to get back when I can. Still got a lot of pirate pride. Um, so it's been great. Now, I also got told off air coach, we crossed paths with Tennessee State and, it, and it over at Vanderbilt, too, because I was still in town, you know, my master's degree when he was at Vanderbilt. So we crossed paths in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't see no at the time. We was at the same <laughs> time. So tell us about Tennessee State, Mama Mother, and really you coached there for a few years there and Land of Golden Sunshine over there on John A. Merritt, man. Yeah, it, it was good, man. It was my first opportunity to start coaching, um, and I thought I knew everything and knew nothing. Um, and, and, and to be able, I actually was coaching guys that were older than me. Um, you know, so it was, it was a good opportunity to get started. There's a lot of tradition there, obviously great, um, great history and tradition with Tennessee state and John Mary and the, the big blue and all those things. And then obviously in a great city like Nashville, you have so many resources that you can get connected with, um, different people you get a chance to meet. Um, also spent time over at Vanderbilt, that area of the country to me is, is my favorite area of the country. Um, you know, if I, when I have vacation, I try to spend a couple of days in Nashville. It's just so much to do. Um, such a rich area, such a, a, a sports rich tradition. Obviously we all know about the music, but such a sports rich tradition there. Um, so I, I enjoyed every minute of it. 